Hello, my name is Norris Elam, and we're going to start our class on Revelation. It was, uh, it was about a year ago, maybe even a little longer than that, that someone came up to me and asked if we could do a class on Revelation. And I said that I thought that was, that was fine, I'd like to do that. Um, at the time, we had already, you know, we had the classes already planned out for a period of time, plus the fact that I had a number of responsibilities that I was busy with. And so it really wasn't a convenient time for to start at that at that point. So we just kind of kicked the can down the road. And at the end of, of last year, uh, it was decided that we would add Revelation and have it in this uh, the series in the spring. Little did we know what all was going to happen. In fact, I, I think maybe it might have been, been a, a, a part of the Holy Spirit kind of nudging us to hold off on this. Because who would have known that at this point in time that one of the buzzwords would be unprecedented? And, and that's a word that we're hearing a lot lately. Who knew that we would be talking about flattening the curve? At the end of last year, I, had no, I would have had no idea what that even meant, flattening, flattening the curve. But those things are part of our world now. It's brought in fear, and it's brought in anxiety and uncertainty and all of those things, and so that's why I think maybe Revelation is, this is the best time for us to be going through this book, because it was written to a group of Christians at the end of the first century, and they were going through some difficult times, and they, they were going through times of fear and anxiety and uncertainty, and, and then this writing was, this vision was to encourage them, was to bless them through that so that they would know God, in fact, is still on control, in control. He's still in the, on the throne. And there's no reason for fear. It was to kind of reinforce, I think, or to support the fact that Jesus knew what he was talking about when uh, he had the conversation with uh, uh, Simon Peter in Matthew 16. You remember, he asked Peter, he said, who do you say that I am? And he said, well, I, I, you're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And he said, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, but my Father who's in heaven. And I say that you're Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church. And then he says, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it, or in some cases not overcome it. And Jesus is saying, nothing is going to stop the church. The church is going to be there from now on. And so it doesn't matter if it's, like in their case, a mighty Roman army with all its strength is not going to defeat the church. And that was to assure them of that. And it also is true that not a small virus is going to defeat the church or set us back. That's true as well. So it's good, I think, that we go through it now because of the kind of situation we have. It's real applicable to us as well. Uh, now, I want to say before we get into this too that I am not an expert on Revelation. Um, I'm not going to be able to answer every question that you might have on Revelation. I'm not going to be able to give you a, a clear, detailed explanation of every vision that we're going to see as we make our way through this, this book, this writing. Um, and I would say too that if, if you know somebody that is an expert and, and can answer every question and can give detailed explanation of every, every vision that's in there, uh, I would I would just uh, like to suggest that that you avoid him because he is delusional. Okay, stay away from the guy. Now, I don't think that it's as complicated as we've made it out to be. I do think there's a lot that we can learn from Revelation, and and I don't think that we have to go through it and come out of it confused. We should be able to come out of it encouraged and blessed as a result of our of our study together. Uh, and I think that in order to, come, to do that, it's important that we just apply some common sense, good approach to understanding Scripture and reading Scripture. And I think if we do that, we'll be surprised at how it's not as confusing, not as complicated as, as we often want to believe. So let's start looking because from the very beginning, we're given some information that's going to help us as we go through the rest of the book. Right from the very beginning, Revelation 1, verses 1 through 3. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servant what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, 
who testifies to everything he saw, that is, the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. This comes from God himself through Jesus, and it was delivered to John as he was on exile on an island called Patmos, and it was delivered to him. And then he was told to sit down and to, walk, to look at this vision and then record what he saw. It, it, this is all vision. Um, uh, this is a story, a, a book that's written in picture form, and he is to describe all of these, all of these pictures. And then in verse 3 it said, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. Now, the idea of reading it aloud, um, you know, that goes back to the first century. Not everybody in the congregation would be literate. And so you had some that could read and some that could not. You'd get the one that could read would get up and, and he would read scripture. In this case, he would read what John had recorded and said to them. And then that way, those that could not read would be, would be in on the vision as well. And so that, that's what that's talking about. And he said, everybody's going to be blessed. Everybody that hears this is going to be blessed if they take it to heart. Now, some translations say obey it. I don't know that we think much about uh, Revelation, we don't think about things that are there that we're told to obey. But we'll find out early that there are a number of things that we're called on to obey in behavior. This is going to call us to make life decisions. It's not just about telling us about the future. It's telling us how to live today. So uh, I have a, there's a couple of analogies that, that I like to use that, that have helped me over the years. It, it started on, on how to approach Revelation. And one of them is that of a movie. Um, it's like it's like the angel comes to John on a Sunday and he's finishing up worship and he comes to him and says, John, you know, I, I, let's go to a matinee. And so he takes him to the movie theater, puts him in, sets him down, and says, now I'm, I'm going to play this movie for you. You watch it. And you write down everything you see. You write all this down because later I'm going to give you a mailing list. I want you to send it out and distribute it. And so he sits and he watches that movie. Um, and a, a movie... All movies will have, will tell a story, and they tell a story through picture form. And what you have, you always have main, your characters, your main characters, and you always have a plot. And these scenes will progress from the beginning all the way through the end as the plot's developed and as the situation is resolved at the end. So those, all those things are in common with movies, and, and that's true of Revelation as well. Uh, if you watch the movie, uh, and you come out of it and you say, man, I don't know what the plot was. I, I don't know what that movie was about. So if that's ever happened to you, and it's happened to me on some, uh, but that ever happens to you, well, then you know that that was one bad movie. And God did not produce a bad movie. This is a good movie. It's a plot that's going to be clear, and it's going to be easier to understand. Now, some of the scenes may seem a little difficult, but you'll know this. When you understand the plot and where it's going, even if you don't quite understand that scene, you know how it fits within the overall picture in the overall movie. And it's not going to change that plot. That plot's going to be the same. And one of the things that I think we make mistakes on when we come to Revelation is we don't always come in on the first scene of the movie. Uh, that seems odd. When you go to a movie, you always want to be there at the very beginning. You want to see what happens first. Because a lot of times there are key things and key things about each character that you're going to learn about from the very first scene. And if you take that out, then all of a sudden you've got a distortion in how you're going to interpret the movie. And you're going to really miss the most important part. So you don't want to come in halfway through. It's kind of like if this were the movie, if say this was the scroll or in, in, of the book of, of Revelation. And this is what we have here to look at it. And you decide, well, you know what? I look at it here, the first five, you know, at first it doesn't make that much difference. I'm, I'm not, it's not a big deal. We'll wait until we get to the, uh, to really begins to get exciting with the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Boy, that's when the action really begins. Well, let's go down there. Here, yeah, here it is on my script. Let's go down here. We don't, we don't need this other stuff. We'll just take this other stuff. Get you out. That's not needed. We'll just start, we'll start from that. Now the problem with that is, you, you're starting in chapter six. Five chapters have already been finished, and the, chapter, the book is only 22 chapters long. So over 20% of the movie is already over. You missed it. Now, if you miss 20% of any movie, you're going to have a hard time figuring it out from then on. You're, you have missed a lot of very important things. 
And, and as if that's not bad enough, then a lot of folks will, will miss more than that because they'll look down through here there and say, oh yeah, here's that battle of Armageddon. I really am interested in that. And after that's over and, and the victory's won, uh, I, there's not much in that to do, so we're wasting our time reading that. We'll just drop that off a bit too. And here's a couple of other scenes that really aren't uh, that great. They're just kind of some celebration scenes in between. Uh, let's just focus, let's take those out of there and just focus on these two or three really exciting scenes and that's going to be uh, all we're going to see of the movie. Well, if that's the case, then it's very likely that you're not going to be able to understand what all's going on. And that's the reason I think there's so much confusion and so much disagreement about the book is because we don't start from the beginning. And in the movie, any movie, will start at the beginning and you don't leave until the ending. And that's the way, and that's the way it is with Revelation. It begins with Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. And we've got to start from that place at 1.1. 1, 1. And it doesn't end until we get all the way through till the Amen. And the Amen comes in chapter 22, uh, verse 21. And so until we get to the end, we have to stay and watch all of it. And if we do it in, in patchwork like, uh, like we just demonstrated, if we do it that way, uh, it's almost as if these scenes become individual scenes and can be individually interpreted. And that's not the case. They all fit together. Each scene adds to that plot. Each scene moves and progresses the movie toward the end and toward the conclusion. If you notice in your Bible, there is no S at the end of Revelation. It's not Revelations. There's not multiple Revelations. There's only one Revelation, one movie, one plot, one theme, one purpose, one movie. And so it's, it's all needs to be taken together in order to be understood. Now the second uh, analogy that, that I, helps me understand is a piece of art hanging in an art gallery. If you go in to look at a piece of art, the first thing you'd want to do is you would want to get a distance away. Because see that artist that's painted that? He's not just painting a scene uh, like an ocean scene here. He's not just painting that. He's trying to create a feeling. He's trying to convey something to you through that work of art. He's trying to get you to feel something, to do, experience something. And so you want to see kind of what his purpose is in that piece of work. And so you get a distance first and you look at it until you understand what it is, where he's, what he's trying to say to you through that piece of work. Once you've done that, then you can move closer and you can begin to look at the details and the brush strokes and all those little things. And you might be able to figure out why he did that that way. You may not, but you will know regardless how it fits in that overall big picture idea of that piece of work. And Revelation should be approached in that same way. Uh, we look at it from a distance and get the big picture, and then we can move forward. Another thing about that piece of artwork is it has a frame around it. Now, this may seem simple, but a frame is to draw all of your eyes and your eyes into that one scene. And they have everybody looking at the same place. Uh, you don't look beyond that. That's, that is the border. That's the, that's the, the uh, limits of that particular piece of work. You don't look at that and then also look at something hanging a little farther over and try to mix those together. That's not the point. You stay within the framework. And that's something that we're going to have to do. We're going to have to stay within the framework as we, as we look at this, at this revelation. And the framework comes in with four parts. You've got uh, one part of the frame is the literary style. That's going to be real important. And then we'll have the setting that it's in. Then we want to look at the relevance, relevancy of, of this work. And then we want to look at the consistency. All of those things determine the border. And we have to be consistent with all those and have those all with, within that parameter in order to have a, a valid view of what this uh, piece of work is all about. So let's start out with the first style, uh, the first the style of literature, which is apocalyptic. Um, you don't have to read very far into this work before you realize it's really different. Uh, it's not like other writings. Um, it's not common to us at all, but for those that were receiving it the first time, it was a bit more common to them because from about 200 B.C. to about 200 A.D., there were a number of apocalyptic 
literatures and things that they could read. So they were more familiar with that style than we are, and that's probably the reason it's a little more difficult for us. But uh, we can figure that out. Uh, now, I'll tell you a quick story about my great grandmother. She was uh, she was born uh, in 1875, and she lived to be 102 years old. When she was just a young girl, her family moved from Arkansas to Oklahoma, and that that move was done in a covered wagon. And um, she lived long enough to see a man walk on the moon. She went through a lot of changes in her life, and she saw a lot. And it was a time of, of great education and a time of, of learning a lot about, about our world during her, during her lifetime. She went to her grave absolutely, completely determined and, and confident that the earth was square. As far as she was concerned, you could talk to her about it and it would not make a bit of difference. She would not budge from the fact that the earth was in fact square. And you can show her pictures from outer space. As far as she was concerned, those pictures must have come from the devil himself trying to convince us that God's word is not accurate because if God's word said it's square, it's square. And her text for that was Revelation chapter 7, verse 1. It said, Then I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds so they did not blow on the earth or sea or even on any trees. Said there are four corners. As far as she's concerned, there's four corners. And, and if something's round, it doesn't have corners. The earth is not round. It is square. And you could not budge her from that. Now, I have to admire her faith that the Bible is accurate all the time. I do. And I agree with her. It is. The problem was not the Bible. The problem was how she understood it because the way she read it. You see, she read Revelation as if she were reading Acts. And they're totally different styles. Acts is a more direct narrative style. Everything in Acts you would assume would be literal unless there's some reason within the text to take it figurative. Now, apocalyptic literature is exactly the opposite. It's very figurative. And so you assume everything is symbolic unless there's a reason to take it literal. It's the exact opposite. And so it was just the fact that she didn't understand that style of writing. And that's what got her to thinking that the earth is square. I think sometimes when we approach uh, uh, Revelation without understanding that style, we're liable to come away with the feeling that the earth is square. And I believe some of the, some of the things I've heard about on Revelation and explaining it make about as much sense as a square earth, if you want to know the truth. So it's important when we look at it, and we'll look at a few things because that style of writing had a number of characteristics that were common among all the, all the different writings that, uh, that we found that were apocalyptic. They had, for example, some of the characteristics were uh, that had a common theme. It would be, it would be in a time of very darkness, it, uh, dark and, and a time of suffering, a time of hardship, people were going through difficult times. Uh, also, there would be good versus evil, and they would both, uh, good and evil would both be personified, and they would go to war against one another. Um, and the common, uh, it would be common that they, uh, that good would win and defeat evil. And, and when they did, that would bring the end times. And the end times would mean that Jesus, uh, the return of Jesus, but the end of that persecution period, that difficult time, or whatever that struggle was, that would come to an end because the enemy had been defeated and life would change and life would be good again. And so that would be the way that that uh, literature would commonly go. It was very, very heavy in symbolism and, and the use of metaphors. Um, some of the common symbols that we use would be with animals. Uh, domesticated animals are always good. Uh, then you have animals like dragons, monsters, and wild beasts. They're the bad guys. Now you can add things to the, to the even to the uh, domesticated animals and give them some horns and multiple eyes and all that. But those things you could tell that what the animal was. Those added features to that animal made it look unreal, but it also was making a statement about something about that with that particular animal at that particular scene. Now. Uh, also, colors are important. We'll look at some of those as we go through. Uh, but before we close today, I wanted to go through the numbers because numbers are a big deal in apocalyptic literature. Uh, numbers tell us quantity, but numbers in this style of writing generally tell you quality, not quantity. And it's hard for us to make that shift. 
we see seven, we think seven. But in this type of literature, when you see seven, it's making a statement about the spiritual completeness or the perfection of something. Uh, when you see the number ten, ten is not necessarily talking about ten. It's talking about, it could be any number, but it's, a, it's completeness, physical completeness. If a king, uh, would, his, his, his reign was ten, it was ten, it would not mean ten years necessarily, but that, that was the length of time that he reigned, the total length of time that he would reign. Um, the number four is nature. That's where my great grandmother kind of got off a bit because it, it, it associates with nature north, south, east, and west. Four, so that's nature. And that you know, seven, one that she got confused about, it just said it just means that all of nature was being held back because you see, that's going to be God's army. When he goes to fight the enemy, he's going to call nature in. And for the time being, they're held back because that's not the time for this ultimate battle in that scene. So, um, Two other numbers that are a bit curious, the number six, um, for us, number 13 is an unlucky number, they say. Well, six would be 13 on steroids. I mean, it's, it is a bad, bad number. It means that you totally fail and you are a loser, is basically what it would mean. Uh, eight is a number that after seven, so seven is complete and you've, you've made it. Eight is a starting over again. So it's a number that would be associated with starting over or with uh, recreation our, our uh, uh, resurrection would be another way to look at it, that it, something would be resurrected from something else. Twelve would be God's people. Uh, you had twelve patriarchs, you had the twelve apostles, all of these, they, those that belong to God, His community. And then the number thousand is, is very symbolic. It's, even if you're not talking about apocalyptic literature, when you get in the Bible and you see thousand used, always pay close attention because oftentimes it's not talking about a literal thousand of something. It's, it's making a statement. For example, Psalms 50 and 10 where it says that uh, every beast in the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. Now, how many hills do you think there are on the earth? I would say there's a lot more than a thousand. When you so does that mean that you count out a thousand and then the cattle that are on those hills, those belong to God, but all these other hills out here, the cattle that are over there, they belong to somebody else? Well, no, I don't, I don't think so at all. I mean, it means that all of it belongs to God. So the thousand represents everything. And then the same thing in First Chronicles 16, 15 there, God is talk says, or, or, I'm sorry, he says, remember His, meaning God, remember His covenant forever the word which he commanded for a thousand generations. That covenant began with Abraham. You count a thousand generations from Abraham, and when you get to there, the thousand and first generation are no longer bound by that covenant. No, that's not what that means. In fact, it makes it clear from the very beginning. Remember his covenant forever. That's another way of using a thousand to represent everything. So we need to be careful, and when we get to the number of thousand in Revelation, there's at least one place where a thousand typically used literally, but there, is there a good reason to use it literally? Because it usually means all the time, all of it, complete. Another thing that numbers would, a um, little trick they would use with numbers would be how they would work them together. Like for example, if 12 was God's people and a, a thousand was all and complete, then 12,000 would be all completely all of God's people. They just combine those two numbers together. If you if you repeat numbers, it's it's like for added emphasis. So six means six, a loser, but if you did six, 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 that would be like saying means a loser, loser, loser. I mean just just emphasis on that. Um, and so that also would be a way to do it. You multiply uh, numbers times tens or thousands, you're just you're just making a stronger statement about that base truth. So We'll, we'll leave it here. We've just done one of the frames. The next lesson that we have, when we come back on, we're going to do the other three and complete that work because we've got to get our framework, we've got to get the foundation for how we look at this uh, revelation, and once we do, then we'll start into these scenes. Again, I hope you'll stay with us. I hope this will be a blessing to you. And before we leave, let's close with a prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this time that we can have together. And open our eyes and help us to see this, uh, the, the great truths in this revelation that you gave to John. May it encourage us just as it encouraged him and those that heard it for the first time. May we never doubt you're in control over everything. 
during these times that we're facing now that are, are difficult and that are frightening and that we are uncertain, reassure us that you are still in control and nothing will prevail against your church. Father, we thank you for your great love. In the name of Jesus that we offer you our thanks. Amen. Thank you, and we will see you at the next meeting. Thanks.